Hello and welcome to Worship with Brightwood Christian Church. We're a, a day late, hopefully not a dollar short about our worship today. Um, coming to you online, I had some computer issues. This is not a shock. The Holy Spirit is working on my patience through my computer. So I hope that um, you are gifted with patience today as well. And I hope that you'll take the time to worship um, even though it's not on a Sunday, that, that God is still listening. I hope you that participate fully in our worship with Brightwood Christian Church. Understand worship to be something that we do together, not something that we watch others do. And so I hope that you'll sing, make a joyful noise to the Lord, even though you might think that that's all it is, is noise. Um, I'm Pastor Jana Quisenberry, and it's my delight to join you today. Our imagery today is saints. It doesn't look like it exactly, um, but we celebrated All Saints Day yesterday, and in our tradition, um, we sort of combine what the Catholic Church thinks of as All Saints Day and All Souls Day because our understanding doesn't differentiate so much between um, those that um, other traditions consider saints and the rest of us sort of just fumbling along doing our best for Jesus. And so this is the day that we remember those in the faith that have inspired and encouraged us and done good work that we might continue to know and worship the Lord. So our imagery today is of things named after saints, bodies of water, mountains, um, cities. And so that's that's what's um, combining it and, and calling those things together. And what inspired me to do that was thinking about the kinds of legacies we leave. Um, we don't always know where our legacies will end up. I'm sure that, you know, as um, St. Francis was um, doing good work for the poor, he wasn't thinking about people naming colleges after him. And yet um, some people may come to know who he is and his legacy by passing a church or passing a college. Um, we're likely not to have anything named after us eventually, but that doesn't mean that the ripples of the work of our faith won't go on far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. And so the, the way that we continue to do that, the way that we continue to grow in faith and in service is by nurturing our spirits through worship, reminding ourselves of what is important, calling ourselves to the ways of being that God has in store for us. And so thanks for joining me in this time. We'll begin worship today by calling ourselves to worship. And you'll see two parts, one and all. Of course, you're welcome to read all of it with me if you'd like. But if you'd like to just join me on the parts that say all, you're welcome to do that as well. In all our weakness and strength, with our youth-filled spirits and aging bodies, we come to be your people, O God. Strong in faith and eager with questions, singing our praise and whispering our prayers, we come to be your people, O God. Filled with saintly determination, yet mindful of our human limitations, we come to be your people, O God. Made strong in your endless love for us, we know ourselves to be yours, and we come to be your people, O God. May we truly become your people today. Amen. Let's sing together. I know that my Redeemer liveth. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer liveth and on the earth again shall stand. I know eternal life he giveth a grace and power are in his hand. I know, I know that Jesus liveth and on the earth again shall stand. I know, I know that life he giveth and grace and power are in his hand. I know his promise never faileth the word he speaks, it cannot die. Though cruel and doth my flesh assaileth, yet I shall see him by and by. I know, I know that Jesus 
Jesus liveth and on the earth again shall stand. I know, I know the life he giveth, that grace and power are in his hand. I know my mansion he prepareth, that where he is, there I may be. Oh, wondrous thought for me he careth, and he at last will come for me. I know, I know that Jesus liveth, and on the earth again shall stand. I know, I know that life he giveth, <clears throat> that grace and power are in his hand. <coughs> Excuse me. Will you enter into a spirit of prayer with me? God of every age and time, inspire us today with memories of saints whose energy still lingers, hovering around and within as encouragement and strength. Wrap us anew with a felt sense of your persistent presence, granting a new energy to offer you everything of our hearts, minds, and souls. Yes, love of life, root us and ground us in this. And let it be more than enough for today as we gather in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because today is All Saints Day, I wanted to share a poem um, with you. It's called All Souls Day, but again, we sort of combine the two. Within the church on All Souls Day, I knelt with those uncomforted, who bowed their weary heads to pray their sad prayers for the happy dead. We, with sting of tears still hot upon our faces, prayed for those who have forgot all tears, forgot the long past pageant of old woes. We of the anxious soul and brain prayed peace for those who dwell in that great calm that follows pain, safe housed in God's white citadel. O oh, futile tender mockery, we hampered, fettered in the strife to pray for those glad souls made free of the great burden that is life. Dear God, another prayer I said, humbly I asked who might not give, pray ye for us, thrice happy dead, for us who live, for us who live. Today, we are reminded that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have in their lifetimes worked for the faith, taught us to love and hope and dream and follow and listen built institutions that would educate and inspire and nurture and serve. But I think that they continue their good work. Maybe through prayers as the poem suggests, but maybe through our memories. I pray that this day you take some time to remember those who've nurtured you in the faith. To maybe write some things down. Do some journaling. Because I think the more we turn to those memories, instead of away from them fearing sadness, the more that our great cloud of witnesses can inspire and inform and educate and nurture our spirits. We remember what made them special to us. And we can use those memories to craft our own legacies, to share with future generations that now need our support, encouragement, examples of faith. There's a reason that I think it's helpful for us to, to think and remember and tell the stories of the saints 
And I think it isn't necessarily because they were magical in any way. Their magic was in their service and in their care and in their faith. Their magic is in the stories that we can hear and learn from and act on in our own lives. I pray that you find ways to do that today, whether of the canonized saints of the Catholic Church or the saints of the church you grew up in that taught you the songs, the stories, and the prayers of your childhood. Let's sing together for all the saints, number 637 in your child's hymnal if you have it at home. And if not, it's going to be right on the screen for you. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou wast their rock, their fortress and their might, their strength and solace in the well-fought fight. Thou in the darkness drear the one true light, Alleluia, Alleluia. O blessed communion, fellowship divine, we live and struggle, they in glory shine. Yet all are one in thee, for all are thine. Alleluia, Alleluia. Will you pray with me for God's people? God of the prophets, God of Christ, we're reminded today that your blessings do not necessarily follow the logic of the world. The world believes that the rich are blessed, but Jesus reminds us that it is the poor who are blessed, the poor in spirit and the materially poor as well. We pray for a world more just in which we all have enough and none are left behind. Though we fear death and avoid it at its inevitable arrival, Jesus tells us that those who mourn are blessed. Help us to experience the truth of this mystery, bring healing and wholeness to those who are sick, and comfort those of us who have lost loved ones. While people covet power, Jesus blesses the meek. Instruct us, O God, in the ways of humility. Help us to stand in solidarity with the oppressed and marginalized. Show us your presence in the faces of those the world forgets. Give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Fill our hearts with love overflowing with mercy. Make our hearts pure and give us a vision of your glory. In a society divided by race, gender, class, ideology, and so many other labels we alone have created, remind us that we are created in your image. Each of us a beautiful reflection of you. Each of us your beloved child. Help us then to end our conflicts and wars. Help us to be peacemakers and agents of reconciliation. Gracious God, you have so richly blessed us with life, with love and joy, with hope in the midst of despair. Help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us to be the light of the world, sharing with others that which we have received, boldly proclaiming the good news of your love, finding the seeds of your kingdom within us and letting your way grow in our lives throughout the world. Give us eyes to see the ways you're changing the world in which we live. Give us ears to hear your call to join with you in the great transformation. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's sing together, there's a wideness in God's mercy as we prepare our hearts for communion. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner, more and more 
graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior. There is healing in his blood. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind as we approach the table of the lord and are thinking about all souls day i'm reminded of this um, old sally field movie i always forget even what it was but it it changed the way that I think about communion forever. They go through the whole movie and there's all the trauma and relationships and discouragement and violence between characters in the small rural southern town. And at the very end, we see a moment in worship. As communion plates are passed person to person, we see characters from long ago in the movie, characters that passed away, characters that broke each other's hearts, characters that were violent with one another, even unto death, passing that plate. I know that the table of the Lord stretches beyond time and space, that, that there's something outside of reality that happens as we take the bread and cup, that there's something that calls us together, past and future. I feel that presence. And even if that's only metaphorical for you, it's still powerful. But what I think may be even more miraculous is knowing that I'm welcome at that table and that those who I would have trouble welcoming are also welcome. And that when I come and I partake, I choose presence with those people. I make the decision to do what God asks in the presence of people that I struggle with in my heart for forgiveness or that have struggled with me in their hearts for forgiveness of me. People I let down or didn't take good enough care of, didn't love the way I should have. And it's only God's grace and mercy through Jesus Christ that helps me to feel at home at this table, knowing who's there with me. But it's so encouraging. It's so life-giving to know that they're with me and present and that we can do that together. And that if we can partake in the Lord's Supper together, if we can sit down at table that maybe those of us still in this world together, frustrated maybe with each other, longing for more of each other, lonely, that we can find a place at this table and use our time at it to transform our relationships and our world. All who believe in Jesus are invited to that table. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread when he had given a prayer of thanksgiving for it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Truly, I tell you, said Jesus, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Will you pray with me? Holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, 
head of our table, master of grace. We are grateful for our invitation. Help us to acknowledge the invitation of others as well to see those that we encounter as beloved children of yours, invited, longed for guests to this table. Open our hearts to those that we might consider enemies. Help us to pray for them and that we might have the mercy that you've shown to us for those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture for today is Luke 6, 20 through 31. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Amen. God is good and all the time. Jesus began turning everything on its head since before he was born. The very idea of God made flesh to dwell among us as the new covenant was all prophecy about the Messiah with a fairly substantial twist. This is not what people were expecting of the Messiah or the new covenant. And we can understand why it was difficult for them to recognize what was happening. When Mary heard that she was going to birth as the son of God, she sang a song about turning the social order upside down. We call it the Magnificat sometimes in Luke 1. He's brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lonely. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Jesus's scripture reading at home in Nazareth, really the first time we see him do that and hear what he has to say in the synagogue are words from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he just sits down like he hadn't just upturned every established norm. In who he ate with, preached to, traveled with, he upended every expectation. Sinners, Gentiles, women, even the religious elite that everyone could see were out to get him, he welcomed. We just had the story of Zacchaeus last week. He got in trouble for eating with Zacchaeus, a sinner. We saw women be the first to proclaim his resurrection, even though they couldn't legally give testimony in court. This is the story of Jesus start to finish, not letting us be comfortable with what we assume not letting us be settled in what the world tells us is right. In today's beloved sermon from Jesus, we see him make pronouncements that go against every single one of our grains, every expectation, every social norm, and yet none of the laws that God already had put into place. He wasn't going against the faith, his faith, the Jewish faith. It was the same faith, but with a twist. Jesus is yet again promising in our scripture to turn the world upside down and commanding us to do the same. For instance, poverty. 
weeping. Resentment and hatred towards ourselves. Those are not things that we see as a blessing and they certainly weren't in the society of the time. We've heard our scripture today so often and for so long that we sometimes don't get as shocked as we should be. But we can be shocked when we think about each item individually. Realizing that even though we know it intellectually, this is not how we've come to understand the world. I don't know of anybody who sees poverty as a blessing. And our society today in its conversation and in its governance and in its media, it's clear to me that we tend to see poverty as a deserved curse, as a punishment for um, any made up reason that you can think of really. Uh, laziness is sometimes attributed to the poor, uh, lack of imagination, uh, lack of intelligence, uh, lack of moral character, uh, addictions, bad choices, anything but our participation in a system that may be keeping people poor. So how can it be a blessing when it's their fault, right? Weeping. Weeping doesn't feel blessed. It feels awful. Grief isn't fun. Grief doesn't feel good. And we don't see it as good. We don't see weeping as good. That's not how you, you know, sell insurance, right? You sell insurance with happy people dancing around. That's pretty much how you sell anything. That's pretty much what we're being sold as part of the American dream is is happiness, not necessarily joy, not necessarily meaning, but surely, surely happiness. We avoid those who weep. We're uncomfortable. It hurts us to see other people hurting. It's easier to turn away. And so oftentimes, those who are struggling emotionally for whatever reason, are more isolated in a time when they need people the most. And blessed when everyone hates us? <laughs> Why then do we judge people's worthiness on whether or not they're popular? Why do we assume that if lots of folks seem to not like someone, it, there's probably a reason? In fact, I'd go so far as to say that Many of our important decisions are not made on someone's ability, someone's experience, someone's depth of understanding of a subject, but instead on how they look, present themselves, how they make us feel, whether we'd take them out for coffee. All the things that we strive for, Jesus warns us against in this scripture. Woe to the rich, to the full, to the laughing, to the popular. That's not how we live. No matter how many times we've heard it, I'm not sure what happens in our heads to say, all right, Jesus, whatever, you know, and then just move on with our lives. It's not how we live. It's not how we see the world. And his instructions, what to do, how to be in the world. We can't really get the full whammy of what it was like to hear it for the first time because we can pr practically recite it in our sleep. But in society where respect was traded like gold and power went to the one who had the most gold and respect, these words would have been shocking and quickly and easily ignored. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Still, even though we've heard it a million times, it's hard. It doesn't feel natural. It certainly doesn't feel fair. It makes us feel weak, embarrassed, taken advantage of, used. And besides Jesus' promise that those who mourn would be comforted, those who weep would laugh, this is the perfect scripture for today because those who came before us in the faith that we honor on All Saints Day have been the same kind of troublemakers as Jesus. Using the tools he gives us in scriptures like this to flip everything on its head. In fact, there's a great story of Paul and Silas at Thessalonica. They've been there sharing the stories of Jesus and convincing many. The scripture makes a note, even convincing prominent women. Um, I guess that was important. I'm glad that that's in there. Which, of course, meant that they were trouble. The Roman Empire was able to stand for as long as it did by keeping everybody in their lane. By keeping chaos to a minimum, change to a minimum. So while the authorities are looking for Paul and Silas, they went to the home where they'd been staying and arrested their hosts. Acts 17.6 says, when they could not find them, they dragged Jason, that was the host, and some believers before the city authorities shouting, these people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has entertained them as guests. They got arrested for not even turning the world upside them, down themselves, but just for letting people who were turning the world upside down stay with them. Paul and Silas were turning the world upside down by telling the stories of Jesus. We'll never be able to repay or even to know what we owe to the troublemaking, world-shaking, faith-twisting Christians who have walked in the winding path of Jesus. But on this All Saints Day, we should absolutely try to take a moment to think of people who inspired us and encouraged us and helped us to see the world or ourselves or the faith in a whole new way. I think about all of the change makers. Some of them took their cues from Jesus because he was their savior and knew him well, like Martin Luther King Jr. Some of them who had just studied his ways and knew that they worked and that the values were important, like Gandhi. Some of them changed the world in much quieter ways, like St. Francis in his poverty and willingness to kiss those that others wouldn't come near. Some of them in more personal ways, like the first person that ever taught you the song, Jesus Loves Me, and made you believe it. If we want to turn the world on its head, we have to follow in their footsteps, valuing those people and things that others would cast aside. The poor the weeping, the unpopular. And we have to stay on the windy path that he has set before us. Loving our enemies, doing good to those who hate us, blessing those who curse us, praying for those who abuse us, doing to others as we'd have them do to us. It's not easy but we're not alone. Let's sing together, shall we gather at the river? 
Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod, with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. On the margin of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Ere we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. May God be with you this week, that you might have the courage and strength and love to turn the world on its head. Amen.